Welcome everyone and welcome to our latest Waterline Pro tutorial. In this video we're going to go over the di our dynamic water simulation. Now first of all we're going to be using our FFT Ocean Actor and we're actually going to be disabling the ocean simulation so we can get something that's a lot more similar to our uh, Lake Actor or Water Sim Infinite Actor and um, yeah just build up from of that. And the reason we're doing that is because this one has the latest and greatest sort of uh, features. For example, simulation dampening isn't quite available at the moment for uh, our water waterline uh, lake actors, our waterline simulation uh, infinite water sim actors, and the water sim local actors. This will be coming at a later update. But for the moment, we can have everything here. And in the first part of the video, we'll be going over these sort of water simulation parameters. And later on, we're we'll be looking into uh, getting objects to talk to our simulation. And finally, we're gonna put everything we've looked at together into like a short video or an, a pre-rendered animation. So to start us off, uh, one thing I would like to do at, at the beginning is to make our uh, ocean simulation a bit more basic. So for example, just get rid of our ocean simulation and add in some texture-based uh, waves. So we're just gonna open our water surface material search for small and we're gonna say use small normals. We're gonna enable that and straight off the bat, we're getting some pretty good uh, lake-like uh, normals. So this is the texture that we are using. This is the tile, the strength and the speed of the motion. So this is looking pretty good. And uh, let's just do a quick test by going into a selected viewport. And yeah, everything is working as expected. So now we're just running the water simulation and everything is a bit more clear and visible to us. But uh, when we, once we start messing with these settings, ideally what we'd want to do is not having to play a full game, but just maybe hit simulate. So let's see what happens when we do now. So yeah, no simulation is happening. And once we exit out, we're getting a bunch of uh, errors. Now, the reason we're getting these is because Waterline essentially needs to know where the camera is. For example, if it's a single player, uh, multiplayer or if it's a pre-rendered animation and we can find these under the mesh settings and camera tracker. Now the default setting for single player will basically pick up the current player control controller and grab its camera and use that as a reference point. Now this reference point is being used to just see where the higher quality simulation and the waves should be generated and as we move farther away from the camera this sort of gets lotted out or not included. So in this case, to get everything working with our start simulation, we're just gonna change our camera tracker to track actor. Now this allows us to grab, to specify a specific actor in our level to track. And in this case, we're gonna select for track actor, our sphere. The other settings for multiplayer, well, these are for multiplayer, which has a separate tutorial that will be linked. Level sequence will grab the camera location of the current cut in the level sequence and track actor will basically specify something to track. And now when we hit play, our water simulation is working as expected and we're not getting any errors. So let's hide that because that's for the ocean simulation and we are not using any of this at the moment. So for starters, our first feature is well enable shallow water sim. You may wanna disable this if you're using just purely ocean simulation or if you just want a very basic lake but basically yeah you'll be just getting some buoyancy with this and pretty much uh, nothing else so we can enable that simulation height controls the height of the waves that get spawned so if we go for something really high let's say like 10 and we hit simulate well now we're getting uh much more massive waves let's go with something bigger really extreme yeah, there we go. Now we're getting some massive spikes. So this is like a simple way of just controlling the height. So far, pretty much everything that we have set up here is tuned for our default third person simulation. So generally a value of two is pretty good, but if you have some really large objects that are meant to be creating massive waves like a ship, then you may wanna start messing with these values. Next up, we have simulation range. And if we zoom out, this basically dictates the shape of this sort of bright, um, square that you see here, bright yellow square. And this is basically the area where water simulation will occur. Now, this is treated more as a range around our uh, object that's being tracked. So for example, once we hit play, this will sort of move to the location of the sphere and this will be the area of the simulation. And this gets updated along with the char 
the character or object position that's being tracked. So this is pretty good. This means that we can get away with some fairly low simulation ranges, getting some really high res uh, simulation results in waves on an infinite scale. But say, for example, you want to go with something really massive like a ship. So for something like a big freighter, you would have this range something set to like 150. And that is because you'd want to have like the full on ship as well as a decent uh, trail left behind it. So this is pretty much where the extent of the boundaries will be with 150. Now, again, for a more normal sort of approach, a value of eight is quite good. So let's just uh, revert to that. And next up, we have simulation dampening. Now, this controls the sort of uh, how far simulated waves will travel before fading away. Now, if you have something really low, like 0 0.9, this value is very sensitive. And lower means less travel of the waves. So let's just hit simulate. And yeah, pretty much everything just being generated here is very nearby. This specific cube we've set up We've given it a special setting so that it always generates waves, basically. But yeah, that's with this one, you can see that it's not really traveling really far or anything. So this isn't quite ideal. Next up, if we go for something really high, like 995, a very important thing is to avoid the value of one because at this point, waves will never get dampened and uh, yeah, things will look weird and you might get some errors. So if you go with something like this, See now, now larger waves are being made and they travel all the way around the edge. And at some point you could say, see them starting to hit the sort of boundary of our simulation. So if we increase our si simulation dampening or rather decrease it, a good practice is to also increase the simulation range. So in this case, let's go for something like 20, just because we're our waves are now being a lot bigger than before. So yeah, now things are looking pretty good. Now, next up, we have normal text size. Now, this doesn't have too much of a, uh, a sort of effect on visuals. It kind of controls the quality or the filtering of the normals that are being created. And really, you start messing with this when you start going into really large numbers for simulation range and uh, simulation resolution. At the current uh, setup, this is pretty good, though really disabling, lowering it by 20, it doesn't have too much of an effect. With extreme low values, you might start getting some sort of blocky visuals, but overall, this, uh, th this setting doesn't have too much of a bearing on visuals. So let's just revert these to what they were. And uh, next up, we have simulation resolution. Now, the difference between simulation resolution and simulation texture resolution is that simulation resolution tells you the quality at which object, location, and shape is being taken into account. For example, if we lower it like a lot for something like, uh, let's see, 64, we can see that once we start moving objects, they're kind of lagging almost because there simply isn't enough data to accurately portray its motion for an object this scale. If we go for something really high, like, uh, like 2K, we start hitting this, we're also not seeing too much of a difference in terms of quality. I mean, there's obviously an improvement, but really the vast improve, the vast uh, sort of difference that the quality of the waves comes from the second simulation texture resolution. So this up top tells you how, how well we're capturing our um, object and the bottom tells us the quality of the waves that are being produced from the object. Now the top value is quite expensive so realistically, you want to keep this as low as possible. But the good news is even with a value of maybe 128, we should be able to get some pretty good results with this one. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of sort of um, artifacts, but it's quite manageable. So now if we go here and increase this further to something like a 4K texture and start messing with it, we could see that our waves got a little bit sharper and maybe we are getting some of those squares. So let's just uh, have a look at our normal texel size and maybe increase that to 60. So now things are looking quite good. Now, really realistically for a really large 
object, something like a ship where you'd have a simulation range of 150, you might be able to get away with a simulation resolution of 128 because ultimately this dictates the smallest details that get picked up. And with something massive like a ship, well, it's gonna leave a pretty big footprint on your uh, simulation stage. So even a low resolution uh, simulation resolution will be able to capture all the details. Now, generally a value of 112 or maybe 1K and a simulation texture of 2K are pretty good for high-end sort of simulations. Next up, we have simulation speed, which is basically how far, how fast the waves will travel. So if we have something like a value of 20 and hit play, we can see that our waves are moving around much slower. Our water behaves a bit more like uh, some sort of slime. So that's something you can always do. Again, the value really comes into play when you start using large, larger scale sort of simulations. So for example, uh, for big massive ship, you might want to have a value of 45 so the waves kind of stick around for a little bit longer and uh, travel further along with the simulation dampening value. So let's just revert these to their original form. Next up, we have a setting for screen space simulation and screen space uh, offset. And this basically will grab the forward vector, vector of your uh, player actor and then sort of offset, make sure that only objects that are within a range of that field of view uh, get added to the simulation. Now, this isn't too important at the moment because our simulation is quite efficient and curls things quite well. And this is a bit of a work in progress feature. So this is something that you may want to experiment with, but it's not absolutely necessary. Next up, we have a tag that says use tag simulation. If we enable this and we can see that only actors with the actor tag splash will generate waves. So if we enable that, we have four, four orange cubes over here that have this uh, tag that if we search for tag over here, we could see actor advanced tags and splash. And now if we hit play, you can see that nothing else is generating waves, but uh, these four guys are, are still included. So this is a great way of having a bit more control into the sort of uh, what is included and what isn't in your simulation. But if you want something to still float or be buoyant but not generate waves, then this would be the tag that you use. Next up, we have dynamic foam, which we can enable by starting with dynamic foam over here. Then we're gonna go into all dynamic foam and uh, let's just leave this these as they are. And now if we hit play, yeah, we can see that dynamic foam is being generated. Now this is quite strong because um, we've kind of messed with our foam settings over here. So if we go to foam and look for dynamic foam power, these are, these are a little too strong. So let's see. Yeah, things are looking a bit more muted than as you would expect. Uh, we're going to go over these in a bit more detail in a, in a minute. And yep, after this, you have all dynamic foam. So anything that's included in the water simulation will generate foam. And then you have CD dynamic foam. Only objects with custom death enabled will generate foam. So if we enable this, we can grab our cube and go to custom death, depth, go, and enable render custom depth pass. And now when we hit simulation, we could see that our other actors don't generate foam from the simulation, but our cube does. So this is again useful for something like speedboats or you don't want everything to be included in your foam. So again, a nice layer of extra control. Next up, you have dynamic foam white cap uh, power. This is the intensity of the foam that's being generated and dampening how long this foam sticks around for. So if we go with something quite high like uh, 10, we'll be generating lots of foam rather uh, just make sure that all foam is enabled. So you can see that a lot more foam is being generated. Actually, it's quite strong. And then if we increase the dampening to something like one, it will a lot of foam will be generated, but then it will die out quite quickly. So yeah, <laughs> you do need to kind of mess with these until you get something that you like. But uh, yeah, we're going to go over all of those settings in a minute. So 
for starters, this is pretty much uh, the settings in within the water simulation. And in the next part, we're going to look into getting actors to work with them. So just one more thing before we wrap up. Now, we also have a setting for a very peculiar setting for a very peculiar issue. Now, for example, let's go to our place actor and play something that's kind of weird. So we're just going to grab a cube here. We're going to make it movable and we're going to give it uh, again the actor tag on. Uh, this is just to make sure that it's always generating waves so we could see the issue quite clearly and generate overlap events. So now when we hit simulate and uh, move our cube, yep, it's making waves much like we would expect. But what would happen if our cube is of an unusual shape? So let's say something long like this. Let's make it extra narrow something like a beam that's intersecting the water and uh, let's just give it a bit of a twist and simulate now and let's just uh, submerge it well we could see that something weird is happening that our beam is leaving a bit of a weird trail of the shape underneath it and that is because of the way we are capturing uh, the beam for the water simulation now to give everything uh, slightly larger and extra nice waves we actually capture slightly above and below the water and this is basically what's happening right here so what can we do to fix this well let exit out and there is a material now i can't show you exactly the whole thing because this is a bit of a compute shader but it's called uh, m scene depth and there's a parameter called um, underwater detection offset and the default value is 50. So let's set it now to something like minus 50. Hit apply. We're just going to put this boy, bad boy away and hit simulate again. Now we could see that things are looking a bit better. But let's go actually correct with something like minus 100. Hit apply. Simulate. And now we could see that we're pretty much getting exactly what we're after. Now it is slightly elongated and maybe we could push the value a little bit further to get just the correct results. But this is pretty much what we'd expect our beam to interact with. Now, if it's something that's actually moving and generating waves, uh, this is a pretty good sort of margin of error to have overall. Now, the reason we don't have it set like this out of the box is that other objects that always cast waves cast uh, slightly smaller waves, as you could see. So the default value is really not meant to account for this. But if you do run into this issue, if you, for example, have a kind of an unusual object with a large portion of it being under the water and above it, then yeah, this is something just to be aware about. Now, finally, another extra bit. If you want to have the really best experience with an object generating waves, it's really um, nice to have at least the portion of it that's intersecting the water. For example, if this was something like, well, if the sphere was part of this entire object, the sphere wouldn't really need to do this, but the beam that is intersecting the water would really benefit if it was using, for an example, a two-sided material. So just grab the material or material instances and just set it to two-sided. Now, if, th if the model is really large, this can help uh, make sure that it's properly captured into the uh, simulation. If it's something really high poly, again, don't worry about the top parts or anything that's up far above or far beneath the water surface. But this is just something to uh, have a look at. So now we've kind of modified a base material of Unreal Engine and uh, yeah, everything's kind of generating slightly better waves than we would expect. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, everything you need to know at this point in terms of objects and uh, water itself. So uh, yeah, in our next section, let's put it all together and make something awesome.